Hello, you are watching People's Dispatch and we are joined by Ahilan Kadirgamar once again to talk about the economic crisis in Sri Lanka. In the last segment with him, we talked about the political crisis, what the government has been doing, what is the kind of opposition that's emerging. Today, we are going to be talking about the details of this economic crisis. Thank you, Ahilan, so much for talking to us again. And one of the key questions that has emerged right now is basically about shortages. We see that despite all these months, the shortages of fuel, the shortages of essentials, even food for that matter, have continued. So why is it that there's a new government in town, there's been a lot of talk with international players, international agencies, why is it that these shortages still continue? One, the the way forward for Sri Lanka, whether it's the opposition SJB, uh, the president, or our newly appointed central bank governor and uh, finance secretary, along with uh, Prime Minister Ron Vikramasinghe, there is a consensus that the solution is to continue on the liberalization path with the support of a IMF agreement, right? So they're very wary of um, uh, undermining the market, so to speak, right? Whatever that might mean. So they, they want the market to uh, function. So th there are huge shortages. Sri Lanka is going around with a begging bowl to India, to even Bangladesh for lines of credit to be able to import essential goods like fuel and medicines and, and even food grains. But at the same time, the reality is, if you look at the data, every month we're getting about uh, 1.3 to 4 billion US dollars in foreign earnings, 1 billion US dollars in export earnings, and about 300 to 400 million US dollars in uh, foreign remittances. But though that amount every month is from the central bank, from the you know, is provided to the commercial banks, and they are giving uh, LCs for traders to go and uh, get their imports. Right. Now, I would argue that this is a time, and and so the lines of credit, for example, from India, India has been very generous, almost I think um, three to four billion US dollars in credit lines, with which we are importing fuel, medicines and even uh, rice and so on. But I would argue even these foreign earnings should be mobilized through a public distribution system to be able to import the essential goods, but the government is not doing it, right? They have, because there's a lot of pressure to adhere to the IMF conditionality, so austerity, plus allowing the market to function. For me, this is a disastrous path uh, to take right now, because on the ground, we are seeing um, uh, you know, production completely being abandoned. Mm -hmm. Farmers have lost faith. There is not enough fertilizers. They were hammered over the last year. So they would rather keep cash and just to be able to purchase food rather than take the risk of uh, producing. The government should be actually giving leadership and, and, and that's why we need political change. The president and the prime minister are completely incapable of providing leadership at this point and give a guarantee to the farmers to produce for small produce because we're going into a food crisis, a very severe food crisis. And we are really concerned about famine type of conditions mm -hmm. uh, emerging. So production has been disrupted, but we're counting on the market to work. And it's plain for everyone to see the cues are, you know, uh, characteristic of the fact that the market is not working. So, you know, I characterize this as not just a business disruption or a business cycle. This is a depression we are in. This is not a recession. Right. We are in a depression. Even the IMF claims Sri Lanka is going to have minus 6.5% GDP growth this year, right? I think it's going to be much worse than that. And you can't then hope the market to fix this. I mean, this is exactly what happened globally in the 1930s with the Great Depression. But that kind of orthodoxy is uh, prevailing and, and, and you know the, the consequences are going to be uh, very severe. I mean, I, I keep uh, repeating, you know, that uh, and, and uh, quoting uh, Nobel Pri uh, Prize winner Amartya Sen on famines, right? Famines are not just caused by uh, shortages of food. You know, we can import food grains, but if livelihoods are collapsing, how much are you going to give in uh, subsidies or cash transfers? Now, right. And for how long can you do it? You have to get livelihoods going. You have to let the democratic process ensure that people's demands are heard by a government. 
right? So politically, the democratic process is being stalled by certain moves by the president and the prime minister with the support of very powerful international actors. And, you know, there's no support for, to resume livelihoods. You know, effective demand in the economy has been completely undermined uh, with this view that, you know, the market would uh, fix the problems. You're saying the IMF conditionalities could really make it worse. Do we have any details on what might be some of the concrete aspects which they'll focus on? Well, the irony is that, you know, what we have publicly from the IMF is their staff report made public in uh, February, March. Now, Sri Lanka, even before we entered into the IMF agreement, we have started to implement those recommendations, right? So, um, for example, they wanted interest rates to be raised. Mm -hmm. In uh, March, April, from 6% to 14%. The central bank interest rates are 14%. Now, you know, what does that mean? For businesses, if they're getting all overdraft facilities, they they're, you know, have to pay close to 30%. Pawning rates for, you know, for rural people, the gold jewelry is their emergency asset. Rates for pawning by the, the state banks were 9%. Now it has gone up to 25%, right? They're probably gonna lose their emergency asset with this right. uh, depression, right? They, they wanted um, for the exchange rate to be floated. Now the Sri Lankan rupee, it was artificially kept strong, but nevertheless has gone from 200 rupees to 360, it's hovering around 360 rupees to the US dollar. Now that extra 160 rupees has been passed on to the consumers, right? So we're seeing the price of bread has tripled a, a, a pound of bread, which was costing 60 rupees six months to a year before is now costing 180 rupees. So, so you know, the price of rice has more than doubled. So what we are seeing in the, in, in, uh, uh, rural livelihoods for the informal sector and, and Sri Lanka's economy, over 60% of it is the informal sector. Their wages have not changed and they are now down to eating one or two meals a day. Right. There's been a freeze on government spending. And what does that freeze mean? That any kind of construction work and so on, all that is coming to an end. So even if you're a farmer, even if you're a, 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 if you're a fisher folk, off season, you depend on mason work, right? This kind of information. So all that has been shut down and they are still talking about keeping inflation low. These are not, you know, this is not inflation as we historically know it with the economy overheating. These are price hikes being transferred both because of the Ukraine war, uh, uh, global commodity prices have gone up. They are being transferred. So you can you can take interest rates up to 50% and you're still not going to bring those prices down if the globally prices are going up and those prices are uh, transferred through this exchange rate uh, depreciation. So we are already implementing the conditionalities of the IMF even before we go for an IMF agreement. So that in a way, uh, after the IMF agreement, they're going to continue to come up with austerity measures in terms of budgeting, uh, balancing the budget. But even before that, austerity has already set in in a severe way inside right. uh, Sri Lanka. And we are seeing the, the consequences of it. The IMF is also playing hardball on the question of debt restructuring. Hmm. Now, you will recall that Sri Lanka unilaterally defaulted on its 51 billion US dollars of debt, uh, you know, debt owed to the uh, in terms of sovereign bonds to commercial borrowings in the capital markets to uh, bilateral donors like China, India, Japan, and so on. There was a push by sections of the uh, neoliberal think tanks for this default because they thought once defa you default, Sri Lanka has no choice but to continue on the path of going for an IMF agreement. Right. But what in reality has happened is that it's made it much harder as we expected for Sri Lanka to get any kind of bridge financing even until the uh, IMF agreement. Because for example, Japan is the big donor of us. 10% you know, of our external debt is to Japan, just like 10% is to China. Now they are saying, until you restructure your debts and we know that you're going to repay, we're not going to lend you any, right? And the IMF is also saying that Sri Lanka has to restructure its debt before 
it can go forward with the I'm of agreement. So we're caught in this uh, trap right now, and um, and we are going to have to give favorable terms to the um, to our donors to be able to come to a debt restructuring agreement, and and before we go to the IMF. Now, there's a lot of international attention on Sri Lanka, I think. Um, uh, and perhaps that's the reason why the West is so much uh, interested in Sri Lanka as well, because there are a number of other countries in Sri Lanka shoes now. I mean, you're seeing the kind of crisis deepen in Pakistan, uh, Nepal's uh, external sector is precarious, and many Latin American and, and African countries, because because of the, 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 the sort of neoliberal path many of these countries have taken with commercial borrowing. So, you know, much higher interest costs that can't be paid and the disruption of the pandemic has created a conjuncture. And Sri Lanka might be the you know, first set of countries that others are going to follow. So how that restructuring is going to work, what kind of uh, response there is going to be to austerity measures, what kind of IMF agreement is going to come about so, you know, Sri Lanka is also being seen as a test case of how the West and our commercial lenders are going to react to this. So there's a lot at stake, not just for Sri Lanka, I think, but for the broader world in terms of what Sri Lanka is going through. Happy. And Ilan, one last question very quickly, because you mentioned a lot of proposals that are coming up. Uh, from the left and progressive spaces, you mentioned some of the proposals you've also been involved in, both at the political and the economic level, uh, recognizing the gravity of both these crises and how these crises are very closely integrated uh, together. So could you maybe take us through some of the most urgent steps that you think need to be taken right now by uh, those in power to sort of avert as much this crisis as possible? In terms of our external uh, sector, we really have to prioritize right, our, our, our foreign earnings. Of course, in the short term, we, we, we do need support from various bilateral donors and so on and, and concessionary loans where uh, possible, but we have to prioritize our foreign earnings towards importing essential goods. Because as I mentioned, you know, without fuel, the economy just completely comes to a halt. Without food and uh, medical imports, we, you know, we would descend into a humanitarian disaster. So that kind of prioritizing is paramount. And that means not just, you know, the, the market is not going to work here, right? The state has to take responsibility of the external sector, but that goes against the whole neoliberal, neoclassical orthodoxy, Absolutely. right? Two, within Sri Lanka, immediately, um, we have to address the food crisis through a public distribution system. We have the food commissioner's uh, department. We have uh, the paddy marketing board, which can purchase, you know, uh, food grains uh, produced by our uh, farmers. We have a large infrastructure of multi-purpose cooperative societies and uh, state, uh, semi-state outlets like the Satosa outlet, and to be able to distribute food. So again, a huge role for the state. Now the IMF conditions, if they're going to insist on um, fiscal consolidation, um, we, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we've been implementing a number of the IMF recommendations, including we have increased again indirect taxes from 8% to 14%, right? Or oh, sorry, 8% to 12%, right? Which is actually increasing the burden on working people. But what we, and even income taxes are going to be difficult because we're in a downward uh, spiral in terms of right. uh, economic output and uh, returns. So we have to consider wealth tax, redistribution. Mm -hmm. And, but you know, none of the actors are willing to go that path because while we go with a begging bowl outside, we are, our elite are not willing to take responsibility and the working people really need to take that challenge forward, calling for redistribution. That the only kind of uh, strength we still have is free healthcare, right? We have universal healthcare in Sri Lanka. Even uh, yesterday I was, I was going and, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to do some field research with um, a very kind of uh, uh, day wage earning farming uh, community. And, 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 and the one strength that they have is if they're sick, they can still go and get free healthcare, right? Their children are going to 
uh, school because we have a free education system. But even there, we have to provide, you know, revamp, provide the midday meal to school children. We have to provide these kinds of uh, universal uh, uh, social welfare schemes. Whereas with the IMF, they're only talking about targeted measures of cash transfers. And, and we right. know, you know, today, when you say targeted, today the, the section of the farming community is in need. The next season, uh, the fishing community is going to be in need. Our entire, you know, informal sector is going to be in need. So these targeted measures, which is, you know, uh, uh, a diversion of social welfare that the neoliberals brought is not the solution. So, you know, how can we think as much as we can through redistribution, these kinds of universal social welfare measures. We are in this for the long haul, right? As I mentioned this year, you know, we could be seeing as much as uh, a tenth of our GDP shrink, right? It's, it's that serious and you can imagine the impact that can have. And this is gonna continue for a few years. We have to think in terms of, we can't think in terms of growth. We have to think in terms of food security, food sovereignty to sort of ensure the survival of the next generation. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Aylin, yet again for that very comprehensive evaluation of what's happening in Sri Lanka right now and that analysis of what needs to be done. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching People's Dispatch.